Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the alumni engagement webinar hosted by uh, the DU Educational Foundation. Uh, we had more than 30 alums that registered for the webinar, which is great, and looks like we're already over 22 that have that have logged in. And so um, it seems like the uh, the audio is off for you all, but we will try to stop throughout the, the presentation to give you all the chance to ask questions, but feel free to uh, ask questions along the way in the question and answer box. Um, and we'll also try to, I think we can unmute everybody. If not, we may have to have everyone write their questions in the, uh, in the chat box, but nonetheless, um, appreciate the patience with, uh, with Colin and I here with this technology, but we have some exciting uh, information to share. So, Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get, get started. And this, this webinar is our chance to dig into what's called the Cygnus Alumni Survey. But before we, we dig into the data, uh, just a quick introduction. I'm Ryan King, and I serve as the Associate Executive Director for Delta Youth Salon. Uh, I've been on the, the DU staff now for more than two years, but have been in uh, the fraternal industry uh, for, for 20 years. So it's been a, a life passion of mine and uh, enjoy my, my time on the DU staff and, and getting to work with such great uh, alums and, and friends of DU. So happy to be here and excited to share some information. Colin? Good afternoon. Uh, great to see so many familiar names. My name is Colin Finn and I also serve as uh, a member of the DU Educational Foundation staff. Um, I've been in this role for about five years, and previous to that, I was uh, a, on the fraternity staff as the director of alumni development, uh, so I was helping put on these webinars. Um, so it's, like I said, it's great to see so many volunteers and familiar names on the webinar today. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's dive in without, without further ado here, everyone. So. Um, what we're going to cover on the uh, webinar today um, is just a couple things. First, we're going to explain the purpose of the Cygnus Alumni Survey that was conducted for the Foundation of Fraternal Excellence. Um, after that, we're going to review some of the highlights and the trends that affect our industry and specifically affect uh, DU. And we're gonna highlight some of the key findings critical to local alumni engagement and fundraising. Uh, we're not gonna share absolutely everything from the survey. In fact, it was a, a nearly a 400 slide document that we received back as a result of all the data, but we're gonna hone in specifically on the things that we think affect local engagement uh, and local fundraising, knowing that that's uh, often where many of our volunteers uh, start their, their DU experience. So. Um, and last but not least, we're going to do our best to answer your questions that you have along the way. And I said this a moment ago, but if you do have questions, feel free to type them uh, in the chat box. I believe we do have the ability to, to unmute you. Uh, if you have a question, you can also, you know, raise your hand uh, and we can unmute you if you have a question. But uh, again, thanks for joining us and we're excited to get to it. So for starters, um, you may be wondering, you know, what is this Cygnus Alumni Survey that, that we're talking about uh, today? And there were three main partners that are involved in the survey, and I'm going to give a quick summary of who they are. First is the Foundation for Fraternal Excellence, and we call it FFE. And the FFE is formally known as the North American Interfraternity Conference Foundation. So um, as an organization, the FFE is a subset of the NIC, but their job and mission is to support the more than 60 fraternity and sorority foundations that have alumni members across North America. So uh, FFE is a great resource for many foundation staffs, including in the DUEF. Uh, they provide you know, resources for us. They conduct research like this. They host conferences and provide different networking opportunities that really allow us as a fraternal industry to collaborate and maximize our work in raising funds for the educational initiatives of our organization. So uh, the DUEF has been a, a major partner with FFE for years and, and many of us, Colin and I included, often volunteer uh, for FFE in, in lots of ways. So they're our, our first key partner that brought this survey to life. The next is obviously the Delta Upsilon Education Educational Foundation, but along with the DUEF are another 37 international Greek foundations. Now, 
Uh, although FFE supports about 60 uh, fraternity and sorority foundations, only 37 of those 60 actually participated in this survey. Um, and of the 37 that participated, 23 were international fraternities and 14 were international sororities. In order to participate in that this survey, all 37 organizations had to provide information such as, you know, contact information from our donor base, uh, giving history from our donors, um, other demographics about age and, and maybe school and graduation year uh, of our donors. But uh, rest assured, you know, the database that we shared and all the information that we shared with FFE was fully encrypted and, and shared uh, through secure means. Uh, because most importantly, beyond securing our members' data, uh, this survey was also 100% confidential. So we have no idea what um, what specific donors said what. We just got to have, have data to reflect the, you know, the collective responses of everyone because it was confidential. So we've got the FFE, we've got Fraternity and Sorority Foundations, and then lastly, Cygnus. Uh, Cygnus is a leading research organization that specializes in nonprofit fundraising. Um, one of Cygnus's key philosophies is called donor-centered fundraising. They're very passionate about helping organizations better understand their donors, better develop strategies that raise more funds for their mission. Uh, some of you may have heard of Cygnus's founder. Her name is Penelope Burke. She's written many books called donor-centered fundraising and on the concept of donor-centered fundraising. She's been a speaker at many high-profile high fundraising conferences. She's actually even uh, spoke a few times at, at the FFE conference and even has traveled to different fraternity and sorority uh, board meetings uh, to share the news of what she's learning both within our industry from surveys like this, but also uh, what she's learning from her study of all nonprofits. So in the end, the FFE has had a long partnership with, with Cygnus, and it's worth noting that this is the 2020 alumni survey but this is the third time that Cygnus has partnered with FFE and fraternities and sororities. Uh, the first partnership was in 2011, uh, and that was the very first time Cygnus did a very similar survey that, that we're going to talk about today. So in 2011, they conducted a survey for us. Uh, they partnered again with fraternity and sorority foundations in 2015 for another alumni survey. So this is actually the third survey uh, that they're doing on behalf uh, of our industry. Uh, Delta Upsilon did not participate in the survey in 2011, but we did in 2015, and we have again now in 2020. At the end of the day, Cygnus is definitely an industry leader. They've been doing research for not only uh, nonprofits like, like fraternities and sororities, but also are doing a lot more research with universities and colleges and analyzing their data, their giving history. And obviously, that is important information for us to think about and reflect on as well. So now that you've got a good understanding of, of who's involved with this survey, let's talk a little bit more about the survey itself. First, this was the largest survey of Greek alumni in history, as there were 128,000 people that, that completed the survey across those 37 organizations that participated. Uh, this was actually over double the response rate from the prior two surveys, so uh, we were just thrilled when we got these results back of how many Greek alumni participated um, as a result. There was a 7.5% response rate from the survey, um, and that is exactly what we saw within Delta Upsilon as well. So that's a pretty good, good turnout for us, which, which means that the data that we collected, uh, and Cygnus has reassured us this many times, um, was statistically significant and had a low margin of error. Now, although 2020, which is when the survey was conducted, was quite the year for all of us with COVID and, and protests for racial injustice, uh, Cygnus did think about those things and took those things into consideration, not only with the timing of the survey, uh, but in how we uh, framed some of the questions. And so based on their research uh, and, and their evidence, they don't believe that these uh, events of 2020 had any major impact on the survey results. In fact, the only positive that may have come as a result of it is the fact that COVID has us all kind of locked up and cooped in our homes, that, that this probably drove our significant response rate, um, whereas many alums that maybe wouldn't have had the time to, to fill out this survey online uh, went ahead and did so, which was, which was great for us. Now, although we can't cover every finding in the survey, we are going to summarize uh, the results in a few key areas. And at a high level, the survey 
you know, gathered impressions and opinions from donors on topics such as, you know, what do they think of fraternities? What do they feel on a specific alumni engagement elements? What sort of communication interests do alumni have? Obviously fundraising, you know, questions about chapter affinity and donor capacity. Those are the types of things that made up the survey, but our time today is going to focus on, you know, really three key areas. Uh, one is fraternal perceptions. So what exactly do our alumni think of, of fraternities and specifically what do BU alumni think of BU? Uh, second, what did we hear about communications and connection? You know, what are the types of things that alumni want to hear about and the ways in which they want to connect with their fraternity? And last but not least, what do they feel in terms of fundraising and, and stewardship when, when donors make gifts? So that's how Colin and I are going to walk through this information uh, with you all today, uh, starting first with fraternal perceptions. Okay, so in terms of the key findings in this area, um, the first is that alumni were asked to you know rate various aspects of their BU experience and we're, we were very pleased to learn from the survey itself that BU alumni were overwhelmingly positive about their BU experience and especially their brotherhood and their social experiences. Um, that's not a surprise and as this next slide shows it kind of highlights you know the main responses that alumni gave in some of these fraternal uh, perception areas. You can see that you know a score of anything over over four, ideally anything over five is considered very good. Once you start to get a score that's in the three or four range, it's in that kind of you know okay, but an area of improvement and anything down below three is considered uh, a, a major area of improvement or a major concern. But you know as you can see this, this slide highlights that, you know, obviously, social experience and the brotherhood and sisterhood experience are what um, you know alumni value most from their DU experience. And although there's no major areas of concern with this, uh, these responses, one area might be the area of mentoring. And this is one where undergraduates probably score mentoring much higher, even though this survey was just for alumni. And you know, after undergraduates graduate and young alumni, you know, get older and move on, the opportunity to network. Uh, specifically through programs and, and activity of the fraternity gets gets less likely. So that's one area of improvement. But Cygnus was quick to say to all of us that, you know, these responses are all very positive. And especially when you start to think about layers two and three about connection and fundraising and communication, if you don't have members that value and, and, firm, and firmly enjoy their experience as a member, then that can often be the, um, a critical roadblock. But for us, we, we've got some good things to share just in terms of perception, which is a great start. The next key finding in this area is that alumni feel the, the overall the fraternity is well managed and trustworthy and that DU leads with integrity. Uh, specifically, our active donors score us very high uh, in this area. Um, alumni were asked, you know, what their reflections and perceptions were on some key areas specific to the larger Delta Upsilon organization. And you can see, you know, many of our overall, the blue bar is Delta Upsilon as a whole, but we separated these out in terms of active donors or non-donors. And it's no surprise that our active donors um, scored us higher, which is actually a good thing. But at the end of the day, you can see the fact that we're above five in all of these, that generally our alumni feel very strong that Delta Upsilon has integrity. We're a trustworthy organization, very relevant today, well-managed, effective, uh, and responsive. So again, these are, are key elements that, that show we have um, good perceptions among uh, our alumni base. And it's not a surprise that our active donors score us higher. It's definitely a positive thing. Uh, but it's good to see that even in, in these areas, when people were asked to reflect on not only how they feel about the organization uh, in terms of connection, but how they feel about the larger fraternity and how it's managed, that we got strong responses uh, as well. The next finding in this area uh, is specific to uh, what the fraternity's response has been to key issues such as alcohol, hazing, and other student safety issues. Um, and the key word here is response. Uh, this was a, a specific element that was added to this survey. Uh, as many of you know, Greek fraternities, including DU, you know, have taken on some, some bigger stances, whether it's an alcohol-free housing policy, you know, stricter rules and regulations on hazing, 
uh, and sexual assault. And we wanted to hone in on this question in the survey to find out, you know, when the organiz organization responds to these, you know, issues plaguing fraternities, how do how does the organization's response affect behaviors of our alumni, or does it affect it at all? Um, and what you can see from this next slide uh, is, is important. Alumni were asked, you know, how DU's response to these issues of alcohol hazing and student safety affects behaviors and behaviors such as you know, donating to the organization, volunteering, recommending students, attending events, or even telling others that, that you're a member. And, you know, for the most part, you can see, um, you know, most said that there really was no impact, and that's probably because so many believe still strongly into you, regardless of sometimes we may see negative things that happen, or we may see some tough decisions that have to be made from the headquarters level. But what's significant from this chart is that you can see there's a much greater group of people that are saying the response that DU has, has, um, has exercised in this space not only is either no impact, but there's a greater chance that it's encouraged or significantly encouraged them when compared to those that might be discouraged or strongly discouraged. So uh, this doesn't mean that, you know, every alum that is out there loves the fact that DU has had to take a tough stand on some of these issues or that every DU, um, you know, is very positive about even their own chapter's behavior um, and their own chapter's accountability. But at the end of the day, when we see that the majority of folks, given that some of the conversations in this space have been difficult over the last few years, that in, in general, we've got some positive responses from alums in terms of uh, that they either are have no impact at all on those decisions or they're highly encouraged or highly encouraged to do some of the things that we know are good for the organization. So I know that was a lot within that first framework of, of alumni perceptions, but I'm gonna stop here for a quick second and, and see if we have any questions. What questions do you all have about this first round of key findings specific to uh, fraternity perceptions? Let's see if I can do a quick check of the chat box here. Looks like we've got no questions just yet. So we'll, we'll keep moving. And if you do have questions, feel free to, to throw them in the chat box there. Okay, Colin's gonna take us next um, with the next area of key findings in terms of communication and connection. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. Uh, so next let's talk about, um, like Ryan said, the, the survey, the findings from the survey that are specific to communication and alumni connection. And the first finding is one that we've heard as a recurring theme for quite some time in our industry. Uh, it's the belief that alumni want to hear more communication that is from or about their local chapter. And to many of you on this call, this is not a surprise. Uh, alumni care most about their local chapter and the relationships that they cherish the most in the fraternity are among their chapter brothers. That's why many of you are volunteering for your own chapter. I know there's a lot of you that are volunteering for other chapters or as well, which we really appreciate. Uh, the same goes for the uh, for giving impact information. As a DUF, DUEF staff, we have heard uh, for years now that we need to highlight how a gift to the Educational Foundation benefits the donor's local chapter. The first slide highlights who alumni were most interested in hearing communication from. So the undergraduate chapter, individual brothers, and local alumni associations were the top three interests. Although that, uh, that is where alumni interests are, this next slide shows that alumni are pretty much satisfied with communication they receive from DU at the international level. See that, that there at the top. The bottom part shows though that there's clear cry for alumni uh, from clear cry from alumni for more communication from their local chapter. You know, more than 20% of alumni say they're receiving far too little mail and email communication from their chapter. Uh, further data showed us that 54% uh, of alumni said they did not receive one thing in the mail from their chapter and 39% said they did not receive one thing via email from their chapter. We know this is not necessarily true and that we're doing our best to send some of that out and people choose to read uh, different emails and throw different pieces of mail away. 
but n n needless to say, there's still some work to do. Um, the next key finding in this area is many alumni don't have a strong connection to the fraternity and their real interest is attending alumni events and volunteering locally. So in the survey, alumni were asked about their specific sense of connection to the different aspects of Delta Upsilon. So you'll see there on the far right that only 28% of alumni felt they had a good or excellent connection to DU. And it's no surprise, once again, that people are connected to their individual brothers and their local chapter. However, let's look at the high percentage of people who said their connection to the local alumni association or undergraduate chapter was weak or non-existent. So our question is, how might we be able to strengthen this connection? So we'll use the data on the next two slides to hint at a few ways that we can do this. So this slide highlights uh, alumni's responses when asked how they would, uh, how likely they would be to attend some of the DU, attend some form of DU alumni, DU event. And you'll see that the uh, top three choices by our alumni are all local events there. Uh, local alumni social event, an event at the chapter house, or, and the local speaker series. Now, obviously as volunteers, we all know that when someone says they will, what someone says they'll do in a survey doesn't automatically mean the person will follow through with it. But let's just start with hosting local alumni events, you know, as a great way to improve alumni connection to the fraternity. And when we think about hosting local alumni events. Uh, I've identified two key ways uh, which we need two key items we need to think about. First is what it, what is it the alumni want out of the social event? You know it's def definitely different than what undergraduates went want. It's different can be different between an older generation alumni and a younger generation alumni. So there may have to be two separate events that draw in two different crowds. And then second, I think the timing is, is also important. You know, find a time when a majority of the alumni can attend this event and also make sure it's not a time when they can be pulled away to different events happening on campus. Uh, make, if we want it to be a DU specific event, you know, make sure that, that there's not, um, you know, another large event that the university is hosting on campus that same day that may take people away from it. Uh, so let's move on from alumni events. Uh, the next slide asks alumni who are not currently volunteering whether they are whether or not they were prepared to volunteer with DU in the next 12 months. So 53% said they were not prepared to volunteer. But let's take a look at the high percentage of people who said they have interest in volunteering locally. 30% have interest in mentoring undergraduates in some way and roughly 28% have interest in volunteering for a local alumni uh, chapter advisory board. So this tells us there's a solid percentage of alumni who say they could volunteer in some way locally. And hosting some form of alumni event at the facility uh, or on campus could be a great way to tap that volunteer potential and also to build those stronger alumni connections. We'll pause here again for, for questions on this area. We do have one question, Colin. It was it's from Jeff. Uh, he proposed it a little earlier. He, his question is, how does Delta Upsilon compare to other organizations? And, you know, for the most part, uh, across the board, DU was anything that we're sharing here on this webinar today is exactly how um, other fraternities fared. There were some variances when you get into giving that are more specific to giving to the larger organization where there was some, some goods and some bads on both sides. But all the stuff that we're sharing here, other fraternities and sororities followed a similar trend. Uh, so when we speak about the data here, it's not only specific to DU, but it's specific to what most other fraternities and sororities were hearing as well. So thanks for that question, uh, Jeff. Any other questions so far from anyone that you want to, to throw out to the group specific to um, either fraternal perceptions or uh, communication? It looks like we have one. The question says, regarding high level data responses, is there a concern that results would reflect responses of most supportive or engaged alumni to participate? 
thus skewing uh, results? Uh, that's a fair, a fair question. We actually asked that question to the Cygnus folks. And, you know, the reality is um, when you look at the number of people who responded and uh, you look at the dynamics and the makeup of those people, uh, it, it wasn't like all the people that responded, for example, were donors or volunteers, right? Which was, which would be an indicator that, you know, we're getting more positive responses because we're getting responses from people who are connected. Uh, there was actually a significant percentage of people, I think it was 65, between 65 and 70 percent of alums that are out there that aren't volunteering and aren't active donors. They may or may not even have an active chapter. Uh, so because this was set up as a confidential survey, uh, the greater chance of some of those um, maybe disconnected alums out there to respond with their perspective is much higher than if it's a survey we're offering where they have to attach their name to, to the response. So uh, again, great question, but not only in terms of the number of responses, but also in terms of the, the dynamic and the makeup of who actually responded gives us good, uh, some, some good credibility to believe what we're sharing is consistent with the general alumnus. Another right. quick question. Go ahead, Colin. No, I was going to read off the next question for you. Sure. Do we see a large variation between chapters uh, on these involvement metrics? Uh, for example, older chapters versus newer chapters, smaller chapters versus larger chapters. That's a great question, uh, Adam. Unfortunately, that that is not a piece that we took to a specific level yet, because Cygnus, um, you know, focused more on the individual person versus the dynamics and the metrics of their specific chapter. Uh, and because the the survey itself was confidential, we don't have any way to to go back into that. But I'll add this as a suggestion knowing that Cygnus is likely to do um, some research for us in the future where I could see, you know, them adding a question early on in the survey that just says, you know, do you have an active chapter? And if so, you know, can you give us a range of how large, um, what's the membership size right now of that chapter? That, that could be an opportunity for us to hone in on some variances there or not, but great question. Anything else? All right, well, let's let's move into the, the next section here, which is our third area of finding, and it has to do with uh, fundraising and stewardship. Now, although the survey's main focus in terms of our participation was really to help the DU Educational Foundation better understand our donor base, um, the specifics for what we have learned and, and are gonna share here in terms of fundraising and stewardship definitely have implications at, at the local level. In fact, the first two areas that we covered, you know, fraternal perceptions and connection, is, there's no surprise that those two things definitely directly impact giving. You know, if someone is has a good perception and understanding of the organization and they feel well connected um, and they feel that they are you know, getting communicated with effectively, those things definitely influence likely that someone would be a, a potential donor. So the first key finding for fundraising and stewardship really just has to do with overall giving to fraternities and NDU fell in this trend as well. It's actually not necessarily a positive trend, but it's worth noting uh, to our group. Uh, and the trend is this, over the last 15 years, all NIC foundations have lost 30% of the number of annual alumni donors that they have. Um, so when we look back and see how many people gave 15 years ago to fraternity foundations versus how many are giving today, that number in terms of the overall number of donors is 30% less today. So that's the, that's the downside. The, the positive side is, although the number of donors we have has shrunk, the amount that fraternities and sororities, including Delta Upsilon, has raised over that same time period has increased by 50%. Uh, so we're seeing fewer donors, but we're seeing a greater number of dollars given by the donors that we retain. Uh, and this is a trend that we've seen at Delta Upsilon. This is also a trend that has happened across all of nonprofits. Um, and it's not just specific to our industry. And the, the biggest reason that uh, Cygnus believes this is happening is, you know, they, they say, you know, this day and age, fundraising is world class and donors are being much more selective and they have much more choices out there. So they're being much more selective with the various charities they support. And, and what it means for us is, you know, that how we make our case for support to our donors um, is 
more and more critical as each day passes uh, because today's donors you know want to know uh, exactly why do you need my support and they want a compelling reason why you need my support and they also want to be shown after they make a gift that you ma you made a difference and you made an impact with their gift just like you said uh, that you would and so uh, nonprofits are being put over much a greater scrutiny in this area, but it's a good thing. It, it's it's a challenge that we at Delta Upsilon embrace, and and we aren't uh, afraid of of the fact that we need to have a stronger case for support. Uh, we fully believe wholeheartedly in our building better men mission, and we've got to continue to continue to think about how we best make the case for the development of the young men that we all know that we serve. So you know, although we've relied on our our top donors to maybe make up some of their the giving from the fact that we were losing a number of donors, this trend unfortunately isn't sustainable. So we can't keep going down this path and saying, okay, every year we're gonna have fewer people given, but we're gonna be counting on those that give to give more. Uh, that's not a sustainable trend. And our hope is that we can find ways to, to counter that. The next finding in this area is that alumni are often motivated to give to their local chapter, but at the same time, we have data that says chapters are not even asking for uh, the support. So. Uh, as part of the survey, alumni said, you know, they were asked what were some of the motivating factors if they were to be a donor to their chapter. And you can see, uh, as this chart shows, that the main reasons um, when someone does give to a chapter, it's because they wanted to see the gift benefit their chapter or their chapter's students. And that's, this is significant. 62% said this was a high motivator for their giving. Uh, again, these are just donors who already told us, yes, I've given to my chapter. Uh, so that's the number one motivator for them. The second is that they see the funds, that there's a need for the funds there at the local chapter. Now, I could show you other charts from the survey from alumni that highlight the fact that more and more donors not only um, are motivated because of this, but they want to see how their gift makes a difference locally. Uh, and again, that's not a surprise. Uh, they've told us this for years and, and it, we all start as a member of Delta Upsilon from our chapter experience. Um, but although the motivation is clear for chapter giving, this next chart shows that all too often, even though this is what alumni say they want and why they would give, um, this next chart shows that there's a real gap in terms of the number of times we're asking alumni uh, to support the local chapter. So um, you can see from this that of all the survey respondents that are out there, uh, more than 40% said that they weren't solicited at all in the past year from their chapter. So um, again, more than 60% that do give say I'm motivated to give because it will support my chapter, but 40% are saying they weren't asked at all. And, you know, although chapter solicitations can come with a clear case for support, it's clear that alumni here are saying, you know, hey, we're, we're being under solicited. Um, this would be a major concern if you we saw you know a high number of alumni saying they were getting you know overly solicited over here but in fact the majority are saying i'm only hearing from the organization once maybe twice uh, or even some you know majority saying they haven't heard from them at all so that's an important data set for us to know that in, in some sense it's a way of saying alumni feel like they're under solicited from their their local chapter and the final key finding in this area is that how local chapters thank donors and show, show gift impact is critical. Um, at the end of the day, good or bad stewardship is going to influence future giving, but especially for first time donors. And I'm gonna unpack this one a, a little bit more. So this next chart shows the level of satisfaction that DU alumni donors had after they gave a gift directly to, uh, to their chapter. So, uh, we said, hey, if you're a donor and you've told us that you've given a gift to the local chapter, um, the question was, how satisfied were you with how your gift was acknowledged and thanked by the chapter? So you can see that the blue bar is specific to Delta Upsilon. These others show the results from other fraternities and from all Greek organizations. And although 65% of you alumni gave a score of five or six or seven, which is pretty good, Notice that we still had 35% that were at four or less, but most significantly, I think, is that we have 10%, 10.5% that said that they were not thanked at all. So if you think about that, if, if one in 10 alumni donors to their chapter say, hey, I wasn't thanked at all, uh, that's a clear indicator that we need to do a better job of thanking our donors, um, especially when they give at, at the local level. 
Now, beyond just being a good practice to say thank you to a donor, the most important point is when we thank a donor, what are we doing? We are not only stewarding the gift properly and showing impact, but we're setting up and, and building a greater connection for a future gift. Uh, it's not about just getting a one-time gift from someone. We want donors to be retained donors every year that give back every year and give hopefully more uh, over time. And this shows how critical um, an area, the area of stewardship could be to improve uh, local chapter giving. Now to highlight this a little bit further, I wanna talk specifically about an opportunity with our first time donors. Now this shows, uh, this chart shows that 20.4% of alumni who make their first gift respond with a second gift the next year. So this section here of renewal year one is saying 20.4% of Delta Upsilon donors who gave in one year responded with a gift in their second year. And that 20% that is actually about on par uh, in terms of first time donor retention that we see in nonprofits. But the bigger uh, point with this graph is look at what happens if we can get a first time donor to not only give a second time, but to give a third time in that third year, uh, look at the greater chance that we will retain them um, going forward. And so what this tells us is not only is acquiring a donor important, but if you can acquire a first time donor and then keep that donor over time, not only um, does the chance that they're gonna give every year significantly go up, um, a chart that I, that I don't necessarily have on here, I could show that actually we see that not only does the chance that they give again go up significantly, but the amount that they give uh, goes up significantly. That by this fourth year, um, donors are giving 40 to 45% more than they gave in their first gift. So uh, that's telling us that for some donors, maybe they're just making, making a test gift. They're saying, well, I believe in my chapter and I believe in the organization, but I'm just gonna give maybe $250, even though I could have given maybe 40, 50% more. And how we treat that donor um, in that first year and saying thank you and stewarding the gift and how we encourage them and show impact to build to the second gift. Um, if we do those things well, not only will we retain donors longer, but those donors will significantly give more uh, over time. So, I know that can be a lot to unpack overall, but what, what questions are out there from the group in terms of the area of chapter fundraising and stewardship that we, that we maybe haven't covered? Any questions out there on this topic or any of the previous topics that we, we discussed? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Colin and he's going to hone in on kind of where we go from here in terms of suggestions. Yeah, we've covered a, a lot in this webinar, but we hope it has been, you know, very informative uh, to you guys and um, we wanted to make sure we left you guys with some final tips and recommendations. Um, these are, you know, just high level and just can't go into details on everyone right now, um, but wanted to let you know if, if you have some questions or takeaways from this and you need to set up some time with Ryan or I uh, to talk about how you can implement some of these recommendations for your chapter, we'd be happy to sit down uh, via uh, the phone or via Zoom with you to talk this out one-on-one uh, -on -one as it relates to your organization for your chapter. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the first one would be to make sure you have an annual strategy for communication uh, with alumni in place that includes email, social media, and mail. You know, the data shows that they want it. They want to hear from the chapter. The second would be to create chapter events that cater toward alumni. And dur during these events, encourage both undergraduate and alumni leadership to build connections and also make the case for giving to the chapter. The third recommendation is that alumni want to financially support their local chapter. So if you don't have one, you can start off a simple annual giving strategy and then make it uh, you know, more robust from there. But you've got to start and make sure to thank the donor and steward the gift. Ryan just showed those data points right there and why that was so important for not, us to, not only us to do at, at the foundation, but for us to do at the local level as well. 
The next one is to that donors can make chapter specific gifts that are tax deductible to a CEA, a CHA, or to a GSI fund that are already established through the educational foundation. So we can help you um, uh, receive these gifts. We can handle the acknowledgement letters and the tax receipts and the stewardship. So we can, a lot of, all your chapters already have these funds established. So we can be your partner in this. I'll chime in on this one, Colin, real quick. And, yeah. and just say that this is such an important one for us because when we look at, and, and feedback that I know Colin and I have heard from donors that say, hey, I made a gift to my chapter, but I didn't hear anything. Uh, we often hear that a lot. And oftentimes it's, it's when a donor just sends a check to like the chapter president and expects that president to you know, thank the person and to show impact. And it's not that undergraduates aren't appreciative when they get gifts, but don't forget that we already have these buckets set up that not only are the only element that can offer the, the official tax deduction to the donor, but we take care of saying thank you. We include that donor in their annual report and showing that they gave at a certain level. We send them, you know, periodic thank you letters of, of impact of how their chapter's performing. And so, again, let us do the, the stewardship and the acknowledgement and the thanking, because a lot of times it's the undergraduate chapters or the local alums don't have the time or the infrastructure uh, to do that. And that's what we're here for. So, um, again, there's some easy ways to, to have a, a, an alumnus. You all send out a link to the website where they can make a gift specific to a chapter element or a chapter fund. Um, and we will take care of the back end of, of doing the acknowledgement and, and the stewardship. So just this is an important one because it's one we've, we've heard often. Good points, Ryan. Thanks. Um, the next one is is just once again about the DUEF team can be your partner when preparing for a capital campaign at the local level, right? So there's chapters that periodically will want to raise a large amount of money uh, to improve the uh, chapter facility, and we can help. Uh, with that as far as setting up the chapter housing account and making sure those donors get the tax deductibility and, and, and get steward for that as well, even though it's for uh, a different um, kind of campaign. Uh, next is, you know, who has the most accurate contact information? So I would could say both or neither, uh, the educational foundation or the local chapter, right? So we need to work together to maintain uh, accurate information for our alumni base. So sharing back and forth, uh, uh, sometimes you'll, we'll get a list from a local chapter and we can add email addresses or phone numbers um, to our database and vice versa, share the list back of, um, these are the donors that have updated their information with the international attorney, but not necessarily the local chapter. Um, so it's just so important um, to share that information to make sure that we're contacting people at the right uh, emails, phones, and addresses. And we, we are happy to share information we have with you all as well. Jana uh, from our office can quickly respond if you know, you're wanting to get updated emails or updated addresses that we have because you're sending out an alumni newsletter. Just know that, that we can respond to those because um, we want to share that with you as well so you can effectively communicate and, and build that partnership. And just last, um, tying up the last five points that I made, you know, we're in this together and any way that we can um, work together uh, will be most successful when we're doing this as a team, right? And so um, whether it's sharing information, sh you know, us helping you create giving links, um, whatever that is, you know, as a team, as Ryan said before, we have the infrastructure and the team in place um, to do some of these things that the local chapter cannot do. And we're happy to help and collaborate to get, uh, get this done. So once again, I know we went through all these uh, recommendations fairly quickly, but please don't hesitate to reach out to Ryan or I uh, if you have uh, additional questions on how we can partner uh, to raise money for the chapter or even help communicate to the chapter. Absolutely. And we do have some uh, some other questions that are on here that I want to oh, make great. sure that we respond to here. One was uh, from Warren. It says, I'm still concerned about the no impact on hazing, sexual assault, and drinking. And do I under have that understood correctly? A yeah, great, great question, uh, Warren. And with that, that no impact just means, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, someone wasn't in 
um, didn't agree with what was shared. It just means that the, the response that DU gave was appropriate and the response that they gave uh, did not uh, discourage them, which would be the negative. It did not discourage them. So the no impact is, is basically the, the neutral. And so don't get caught up on the word no. It just means the, the response was neutral. But the, where Cygnus asked us to hone in on is that you're generally going to get that 50 to 60% that say, hey, no difference. Um, but what you want to look at is where is there, the, is there the greater response outside of that on the encourage or discourage? And for us, it was clear that it was encourage or strongly encourage uh, so that the response DU has, has done as an organization and the leadership that the organization has done in that space. Uh, collectively, there are many more alums that say that encourages them to give, to volunteer, to stay connected more so than the, the select few that may say, hey, I'm discouraged by that. Hope that answers the, the question there. Uh, let's see, what other questions do we have? Next question, uh, do we have any suggestions when it comes to frequent requests for one-time donations and setting up automatic recurring donations? So I'll touch on first the automatic recurring donations. Yeah, our website, um, our giving form, ask that when you go in to make a gift. So uh, would you like to make this recurring? And you can do it uh, recurring yearly, you can redo it monthly, and you can set the number of months or you could do it indefinitely. And, and that's um, kind of a whole nother webinar of recurring, recurring giving it is um, how successful organizations are when they have a strong recurring gift program. So I think it's very important to, to, to encourage uh, donors to to set up the recurring gift. It, it can help younger alumni with budgeting. Um, so it's very uh, important to, to have that. And we have the infrastructure in place to do that, to go to you know, chapter CEA accounts or housing accounts. Um, and then as far as how frequently to ask for one-time gifts, you know, I think it's um, is, is frequent as um, you're able to do it as an alumni association. So um, if you're sending out two mailings a year and you're gonna ask for the gifts in the mailing, um, I think that's important. It's, you can follow up at the end of uh, your calendar year, um, listing the number of people that have given so far this year and uh, putting in how far away you are from your goal or if you've hit your goal, uh, saying you wanted to stretch the goal to hit a certain dollar figure to, to get more people to, to um, you know, three more recruitment scholarships. So, um, you know, I don't think it's, if you're asking in different medians and you're ask, and you're having um, the request is specific. And then also when you're doing those follow-up asks, you're also reporting, you know, how the chap, what the chapter has done with those, those gifts. So, um, you know. I'll add to that one real quick, Colin. I think um, in terms of just the frequency, you know, most uh, like direct mail providers and, and even kind of our general rule at the foundation is kind of a six month rule uh, before you ask for, you know, a second, a second gift within a year. But what that's probably actually the not as important as the other piece, which is the time frame, you know, even though you can have some general rules, what's most important is what did you do in response to the to the most recent gift? Uh, so what have you done, if you've not done anything to say to someone, hey, here's, thank you for your gift for one, and oh, by the way, here's how your gift made a difference and is still making a difference, that the more you do those things that aren't solicitation, but are reinforcing a prior gift, when those things happen, you set yourself up to avoid coming off as over soliciting, because then, you know, the donor is hearing from you in times when you're just thanking them and recognizing them and highlighting how their gift uh, made a difference. And even and that goes for people who maybe aren't donors. You can still communicate to all, to, to non-donors, how other people's gifts are making a difference. And so it, it's, all, it's all connected and linked. We generally aim for that six month to nine month rule, but at the same time, the most more important is what are you doing in the times when you're not asking for a gift? Because the more you do those things, you'll know when it's right and when you have a clear case to ask for uh, to, to for a gift, but at a minimum, at least once a year, uh, alumni bases should be asking for uh, some annual support. But again, if the only thing that they're communicating once a year is that they need money, well, that's that's not good stewardship. You've got to do other things along the way that build that connection and that reinforce 
um, future gifts, but also thank prior ones. What other questions do we have out there, Colin? Um, the, how much did it cost for DU to get this data and what is going to be done to ensure we get a return on the investment? That's a really good question, actually. And um, it was the costs, I don't have the right here in front of me, but because we participated with so many other uh, Greek foundations on behalf of FFE and we already pay a, a very small uh, kind of membership fee to FFE, um, it's it's insignificant in terms of the large uh, the large foundation budget that we utilize for both solicitation and fundraising and stewardship. So um, it wasn't a, a significant amount, um, but at the end of the day, the, the the value of the information we feel is very significant. And this is actually going to be one of three ways in which we're utilizing the data. One is to share it with alumni and volunteers. Uh, we're also going to be diving in on the data itself that impacts maybe the work of the staff and we'll be highlighting some of the themes, some of which are similar, some are, are different and new to the staff. And then we're also going to be sharing the results of this survey with both boards so that they know what are the perceptions that are out there from alums, what are we seeing, and obviously the foundation board, for example, will really hone in on what are alumni saying about giving, what did they say about planned giving, uh, what, are the, what, is, what were the major gift uh, trends that we saw in there. So um, those three areas of board leadership, staff leadership, and, and you all as local volunteer and alumni leadership are how the information is being disseminated uh, to encourage that, that good return on, on why we participated in the survey. Great question, Frank. Uh, next, Ryan, how do we sell the value of donating to something like GSI in the post-COVID era, especially when alumni and undergrads are more concerned about revamping local engagement? That's a good question. What, what's your, your take on that one, Colin? I have a few thoughts, but I'll let you start with that. Yeah, you know, I think that that um, as far as fundraising for GSI, I know uh, a lot of um, chapters have success when, when they focus GSI on having specific philanthropy events on campus. Uh, I know a lot of that's changed this year as far as what kind of events they can do on campus. So they're fundraising from, from other uh, Greek organizations or other students uh, on campus and charging you know, a small five, $10 fee to come you know, get ice cream or food or some, something to that uh, uh, value. And I think um, the important thing there is that they're still um, trying to encourage or to talk about what GSI is and, and the case for support there. I think it's been tough for our membership to do that recently when your your leader, you know, we haven't had a GSI trip in, in close to a year and a half and our students, uh, our leadership turns over fairly quickly. So there's a lot of exec board meter members that haven't experienced GSI and can't tell that story well. And I think that's definitely a concern that we've heard and, um, that you know, hopefully in January of 2022, we're back and, and are participating. Um, so I think if they if the members focus on doing you know fundraising at the local level as far as on campus through um, you know through other peers on campus, like just like they're participating in other sororities and fraternities, philanthropies, that way uh, they can do that, and that way that gives the alumni. Um, more time uh, and, and energy to um, work on revamping the local engagement. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that and say, you know, I think for me, and we, we talked about this at the regional leadership academies with the chapter officers, um, you know, we talked about the role of GSI collectively for the larger organization. And, um, you know, Let's be honest, I, I'm not a member of Delta Upsilon, but I've had great connections and interactions with many fraternities and sororities uh, at the international level. And I can tell you that very, very few, and I can't think quite frankly of any other organization that not only has a national service project, but it's not just a, a national philanthropy where alumni are asked to give to some other thing. It's actually a gift to something that one makes a difference for those students and those uh, underprivileged uh, people in Jamaica, but more importantly, our students actively participate in the work and in the service. And so to me, when you think about th the best way to sell it, well, one, we've got to get back to doing sessions, <laughs> which, which is coming once we get post COVID. But to me, in terms of the best way to sell it locally is, you know, 
you know, to remind folks that, hey, you know, we're not just asking you from the chapter to make a gift uh, to some local American Cancer Association or some, you know, other local charity, which those things I'm sure would all be good, but we're asking you to do this, but then our students are also going to actively do the work and do the service at the same time by attending um, and building the, you know, the school and doing the things that actually put your dollars to use with some hard labor as well. So just don't under underestimate the value of that extra element that GSI offers, because quite frankly, in the fraternal industry, there's nothing like it. And many, many fraternities and sororities would, would love to have a national philanthropy that isn't just, hey, we give to support X, it's we give to support this, and then our students actively do the service and the work and, and see the impact firsthand. And so it's quite a magical combination. And, and that's a great way, I think, to, to best sell it and talk about it with alums. All right, looks like we have time for one more question here. It says, how has alumni engagement and donations been affected at a national level as a result of the substance-free housing policy or has it not fluctuated much? Uh, good question. We kind of touched on this in terms of what the perceptions were. We didn't necessarily highlight, you know, what exactly have we seen in terms of actual dollars since um, that policy was enacted, but um, at a high level, you know, just for one example, you know, last year we saw the largest annual fund ever for Delta Upsilon, uh, and the year before that was the second largest. So when we think about what has been the collective giving uh, that DU has seen since that, that policy, if, it's, it, if you just look at the annual fund, it's continued to go up. Um, obviously, different local chapter campaigns that either do or don't happen in certain years can fluctuate gifts to other funds. Uh, but when we think about the overall engagement and the overall gifts we're receiving from alums, for us, it's been going up on the national level. And again, that doesn't mean that we haven't had um, a random alum or two that's upset about that policy or is disappointed. Uh, but this survey, we think, has kind of validated the fact that, hey, for some, you know, they expect a DU to respond to some of these trends and, and it's not necessarily gonna make an impact for them. But and for those that it has made an impact, there's a greater number that have said that DU's response to those issues has increased their support or increased their giving than those that maybe were, were discouraged or um, said that they weren't gonna have a connection with the organization. So um, again, data isn't always the end all be all, but it can tell you important things. And so um, this will be important for us to share with the board because you know, substance free housing won't be, you know, the last tough issue that DU has to wrestle with in terms of policy and support. Um, but at the same time, we're, we are encouraged that, that giving to the foundation overall has continued to go up uh, over the last few years. We still have that challenge of seeing a fewer number of donors, uh, but even this year alone in FY21, we with our, our most successful founders they have given in November, we think we're actually going to see an increase as well for DU in terms of the total number of donors, which will be a first for us uh, in a few years, which is which is great. So really, really good question. And uh, just Colin and I really want to thank you both. or We both want to thank you all for taking the time to, to talk with us today. Here's our, our contact information. Uh, via email. As Colin said, feel free to reach out to us directly if you have further questions or you, you know, you want to dive in specifically on an element of the data, I would say contact me because I, I'm the one that's analyzed it uh, the most, even though Colin is probably your best resource in terms of, hey, how do I maybe implement some things at the local chapter level since he's had that experience and, and volunteers for his own uh, Iowa State chapter. Um, but really, really thankful that we were able to do this and always appreciative and, and willing to offer support where we can. So, uh, Colin, anything I missed or any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, just, you know, with uh, going on on the theme of, of us continuing to raise more money every year, um, you know, we we tell this to the fraternity staff. And I want to tell it to you guys as uh, men and women as volunteers that, you know, we just go out and tell the story of what the fraternity is doing to help us raise money or to help raise money, right? So we wouldn't be able to tell the great stories of what our chapters were doing without your support as local volunteers. So I just want to say thank you for all that you guys uh, do because um, we're just out there telling, telling your stories, telling the success of the chapters uh, when, and that's helping us raise money, uh, more, more and more money, every, more and more funds every year. So thank you. Absolutely. 
Thanks again, everyone. Let us know how we can help you from here. Take care.